There's a few questions online and here, but we're going to wait till tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So, so, okay. So I think we've done enough about death and dying at the moment. Unless it's urgent. Are they all about death and dying? No. They're not. Okay, good. Okay, well, so we'll now... Let's just do an overview of what we've talked about since the beginning. Mm. We've been discussing this Buddhist path to enlightenment, which is expressing, expressed very perfect. The goal of which is expressed perfectly in the in the Tibetan equivalent of the Sanskrit word Buddha. Sangye. Sang implies the utter eradication from one's own mind yeah. of all the ego grasping, all the fears, all the dramas, all the attachment, anger, anxiety, jealousy, depression, nonsense. This is Buddha's own direct experiential findings. This is what he said he accomplished. You know, as one... It's not, this, this is not, and then the second syllable implies the develop, a sangye, implies the development of all the other stuff in us to perfection, goodness, wisdom, clarity, virtue. This, the, for the Buddha, is, is, is central to who we are, is integral to who we are, is inextricably part of who we are, and can be developed to perfection. <laughs> Eh bien, implique le développement à la perfection de toutes les vertus, de toutes les qualités, de toutes les bonnes choses dans notre esprit. And this exists in our mind. Et ça, ça existe dans notre There's esprit. There's no other part of us that Et it exists in. It's our mind. C'est uh, dans notre esprit, c'est pas dans une autre partie de nous. So we said right at the beginning. Donc, comme on l'a dit au début. If that's, if that's the goal, si ça, c'est l'objectif, obviously, Buddha's methodology donc, de manière évidente, la méthodologie du Buddha shows you how to get it, vous montre comment y arriver, how to accomplish it. Comment l'accomplir. So then the crucial point is, if that's in our mind, alors, then we need to know what he means by the mind. Alors, le point crucial, c'est que si ça est dans notre esprit, il faut savoir ce que l'on veut dire par esprit. So Buddha's view about the mind and, uh, is that it's not, like we talked, it's not physical. Donc, la vue bouddhiste de l'esprit, comme on l'a dit, c'est qu'il n'est pas physique. It's far more subtle, there are far more subtle levels of our mind that certainly the Hindus before the Buddha and the Buddha himself and the Buddhist tradition would act would would um, uh, uh, posit and that we need in the long term to access. Mm. That this this consciousness of ours, which which is uh, the next point about it, it's it's a it's a word that's used synonymously with the word consciousness. This mind of ours. Yeah. Refers to our con- concepts and intellect. Mind is referring to our feelings and emotions. Et donc, esprit, si ça se réfère à nos sentiments, nos émotions, mind refers to our instinct, intuition, all these subtle levels of our mind that we never access. Et l'esprit se réfère aussi à nos instincts, nos intuitions, tous ces niveaux plus subtils de notre esprit qu'on n'accède jamais. The next point about the mind that's really crucial for the Buddha. Et puis, point suivant à propos de l'esprit qui est vraiment crucial pour le Buddha. It's not given to us by somebody else. C'est qu'il ne nous est pas donné par quelqu'un d'autre. There's no part of us that comes from a superior, some, some, some superior, some, some creator. Il n'y a aucune partie d'entre nous euh, qui vienne d'un euh, créateur, d'un être. No concept like that in Buddhism. Il n'y a aucun concept similaire dans le bouddhisme. And we certainly not, we're not, our mind is not given to us by our mommy and daddy. Et il est certain que notre esprit ne nous est pas donné par maman et papa. They give us a brain. Ils nous ont donné un cerveau. That's not our mind. Mais ça, c'est pas notre esprit. Surprisingly, for neuroscientists, and if we're used to that view, it sounds a bit shocking. Et, et donc, ça, c'est surprenant. Et pour un neuroscientifique, si on est habitué à cette vue, ça va sonner plutôt choquant. So it's been marvelous these last 30, 40 years, the Dalai Lama and all the um, t- Tibetan Buddhist scholars having these amazing meetings with all the best brains in the West, which have these seemingly opposite views have been coming together, finding meeting points, which is fantastic, you know. Et c'est fantastique que dans les 30, 40 dernières années, ben, il y a eu toutes ces réunions qui ont été organisées entre eux et euh, le Dalai Lama et les plus euh, grands euh, érudits euh, bouddhistes euh, tibétains et que et les plus grands cerveaux de, parmi les scientifiques de, de l'Occident, mmh. les plus grands scientifiques de l'Occident et qui ont fait toutes ces réunions 
pour essayer de trouver ben, des points, des similitudes, des points sur lesquels ils se, ils se rencontrent. Much, much of which has all been published in English and I presume French. As, on fait l'objet de publication. Probably in French en as well. Mm. Um, but this is the Buddha's view. It's not, mais, it's not the function of the brain. It's not the product of the brain. The way I'd say it is, at the grosser level of consciousness, la façon dont moi je dirais, then le the brain is like a... That what goes on in the brain is a physical indicator of what's going on in the mind. Because body and mind are intimately connected. But for the Buddha, they're absolutely separate. Interco interconnected, but separate. So if... Okay, so if our mind has this potential to become a sangye, rid the mind of all the rubbish and grow all the goodness, well, that implies the view in Buddhist psychology. There are these two distinct categories of states of mind. Negative, neurotic, deluded, ego-based, fear-based ones. That are the source of our suffering now and in the future, and the cause of why we harm others. And the virtues are the source of our happiness and why we help others. So we need to make this distinction. That's the job of being a Buddhist. Day to day. That's the job of being a Buddhist. But there's the other job we should do first, because we're out of control with our body and speech, so our first level of practice is harness the energy of our body and speech. Behave nicely, do what your grandma says. Don't harm sentient beings. So that's, you know, like I've been saying this, uh, quoting this in a nice analogy that a bird needs two wings. Wisdom and compassion. So this first stage is the Buddhist practice. Junior school, control your body and speech. High school, control your mind. Well, you really become a Buddhist there. That's the wisdom wing. That's all the work you do on yourself. And you are the beneficiary. Because this brings in now the other thing we talked about is the view of Buddha's view of karma, the law of karma, this natural law that runs the universe. Or the, the, way, the, the law that determines the way the universe manifests, the way our lives manifest. It's driven by the law of karma. And a radically, a radically different view from, say, the materialist view. So it takes time to hear it. And in many ways, sort of similar to the Christian and Muslim views, but some fundamental differences because they do not. Buddha does not posit a creator, a boss, a punisher, and a rewarder, which is how we tend to think of morality. There's no view like that in Buddhism. So that's how we've talked the last three days, I think. Hasn't Donc, un, mm. Looking at what suffering is, Donc, on a parlé de la what causes it, which implies our practice. So the more we do this part of the practice, the more we benefit, the less neurotic we become, the more stable, the more adult, the more grown up, the more accountable, the less victim, the less blame, the less depressed. That's practice. That's what practice brings. Because we're using the law of karma as our basis for living our lives. That every millisecond of what we think and do and say in the past, because our consciousness has not been created by anybody, which doesn't begin in the mother's womb, comes from the past. That's the fundamental point for the Buddha. 
and is driven by this law such that whatever we think and do and say programs this consciousness so seeds in this consciousness that will produce our future. So His Holiness says, law of karma is like self-creation. Very different view from the Christian teachings. Very different view from the materialist teachings. This is Buddha's view. Now we have the compassion wing. We're on this, so in the beginning, we're caught up in our own misery. We start lessening that, which then causes us to sort of open our eyes and realize that, oh my God, we're in the same boat. Everyone's, everyone suffers. Everyone wants not to suffer, but get confused about the causes, you know. Yeah. So we now develop, try to develop compassion, empathy for others, yeah. love for others. We try to now consciously cultivate the virtuous qualities. So, in like in this tradition, that all these techniques, all these meditation techniques, these systems, these techniques have developed over the centuries. That we use in our meditation and our daily life to help us grow incrementally in love, compassion, great compassion, which eventually culminates in this amazing state of mind known in Sanskrit as bodhicitta. So first of the wisdom we kind of begin to put ourselves together. We continue practicing on our mind, that never changes. But in the compassion wing there's a distinct difference. In the first stages of practice, in the wisdom wing, the, the main, the main, the main, the main, the, the under, the main purpose is to refrain from harming others, to protect yourself from creating your own future suffering. So, by, by practicing the ethics of restraint, you know, don't kill, don't lie, don't steal, don't bad mouth, don't this, don't that. We subdue our own body, mind, and speech. We become a better, nice person. More wise, more stable, more content, more fulfilled. Wow, amazing. We're the beneficiary. But as Lama Zopa says, every other sentient being is happy. The purpose is to stop killing and lying stealing because I don't want further suffering. I get the benefit. But all the rats and roaches are happy. They all have a party because we leave them in peace. <laughs> the compassion wing we continue to work on our mind, but now it's in relation to breaking down the, the false barriers that ego has created that separate us from others. Mm. So there's all these series of techniques that have cult been cultivated over the centuries. And there's one little group that's got 11 little techniques, or so a series, yeah, 11 little kind of bullet points. It's a combination of those two techniques that Rinpoche mentioned. There are six causes and one effect, and the second one called exchanging self for others. And the, the combination of these is this 11. Oh. It's a incremental, gradual progression to the development of incredible levels of love and compassion for all sentient beings without exception. 
et pour faire grandir l'amour et la compassion jusqu'à ce qu'on arrive à l'éprouver, cet amour et cette compassion, à les éprouver, cet amour et cette compassion pour tous les êtres sans aucune exception. Which sounds ridiculous, right? Bon, pour nous, ça sonne ridicule. Hein? Look how hard it is to love one person. Mais regardez comme c'est dur de aimer ne serait-ce qu'une personne. You mean I gotta love all of them like that? Et donc, on va dire, mais tu veux dire que je. je these words are, tous les êtres you know, these words are easy to say. Donc, ces mots sont faciles à dire. But actually, they should scare the life out of us. En fait, ils devraient, eh bien, nous, nous faire flipper. It's kind of intense. Parce que intense. But because it's religion, Mais parce que de la we love to say words like that. Oh, I love everybody. Wah, 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 you know. But excuse me, to do the job, if you think controlling your body, speech and mind not wanting to murder your husband is hard work, this is a billion times harder. The words, the words love and compassion sound so cute. But they're intense to really develop the way Buddha is saying we can. And not just to have occasional emotional feelings every now and then. But to grow these states of mind stably, consciously, continuously, it's kind of intense. Yeah. So how do we even get our head around the concept of the Buddha saying we have the capability of loving, having affection and love for all sentient beings? How can how can we fit that into life? It's, it seems too, too ridiculous. Mais donc, comment arriver à faire que, effectivement, nous arrivions à générer un tel état d'esprit d'avoir de l'amour et de la compassion pour tous les êtres Well, right now, why it's so hard to hear Et à cet instant, aujourd'hui, pourquoi est-ce que c'est si dur de leur Because of the status quo. Bah, à cause du statut Being a samsaric person, the way, the, the, way the, the way the Buddha would put it. Étant une personne samsariste, comme le dirait Bouddha, as we've learned in the Wisdom Wing, et comme on l'a appris dans l'aide de la sagesse, you know, the Buddha would, uh, 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 he's identified in his view of the mind, which is very extensive, mm. in his view of the mind, which is dealt with very extensively in all the literature, le Bouddha a identifié dans sa vue de l'esprit et dont on, on traite de manière très extensive et vaste dans, In the category called negative and neurotic states of mind. dans la catégorie appelée état d'esprit négatif et neurotique, As we discussed, comme on en a parlé, he did have identified 84,000 distinct different neurotic states of mind. Donc le Bouddha a identifié 84,000 états d'esprit neurotiques différents. Delusions. De délusions. Afflictions. Afflictions. Or, as we could say, translation, mental illnesses. Yeah. But he now, as I said, he brings it all down to three. The three poisons. The three toxic emotions. Ego grasping or ignorance, ignorance. Which has a particular function that we discuss in the wisdom wing of being very narrow-minded and fundamentalist and kind of very concrete. Qui a cette fonction particulière, comme on l'a discuté dans l'aile de la sagesse, d'être particulièrement mm. étroite d'esprit, intégrée. Kind of very complètement... ignorant, very ignorant, very unaware of cause and effect, very kind of very ignorant, like, like a very, you know, think a very ignorant person. Who doesn't, ignorant, you know, there's one aspect of ignorance, one consequence of ignorance. Très ignorant, yeah. très inconscient de la loi de cause et d'effet, yeah. comme une personne très ignorante. And then on the basis of this, we have attachment. Et sur la base de ça, on a d'attachement. Huge attachment to get what I want every second. C'est énorme attachement de tenir ce que je veux. And on the basis of attachment, not getting what it wants. Et sur la base de cet attachement, et eh bien, qui n'obtient pas ce qu'il veut. Aversion. So the three poisons. Donc, et... The three poisons. The three toxic emotions. And when we understand these deeply, and the words sound so cute, but they, when we understand them deeply, we have a really deep understanding of Buddhism and our own practice. Yeah. So these three states of mind have their own objects. You know, the objects of attachment, the things that we think will make us happy. So we grasp at them. And then we have aversion or anger for all the things and events and people and tastes and smells that we think cause us suffering. So we push them away. Then we have ignorance, which is kind of like sort of ignorance. 
<laughs> Now, the compassion wing, we understand this model, these three poisons. We're going to look at these same three states of mind. But now, particularly in relation to the way they cause us to divide all sentient beings into these three categories. Not the objects, just sentient beings. Yeah. And this is everybody in the universe. This is the monkeys and the dogs and the ants and the humans. We have attachment and, and for, for sentient beings. And we can call them friends. They're our, they're our beloveds. The ones who make us happy. The ones who do what my attachment wants. Then we have enemies. We mightn't use that word. But they're the objects of our aversion. You know, who don't make us happy. And then 99.999% are called strangers. Who've ni neither harmed nor helped us. So we're super attached and think about all the time the beloveds. We have really strong anger or aversion and we think about them all the time as well, the enemies. <laughs> With the rest. Because they've neither harmed nor helped us. They don't even come into our mind. So there's another aspect of ego grasping, of ignorance, that manifests here in terms of sentient beings. They're strangers. Therefore, I have indifference. Couldn't care. Couldn't care. Can't be, just don't care. Yeah. Well, these are completely ego-based made up states of mind, made up categories. So right at the beginning of these 11 little steps, we have to change, the, shift the log, we have to change egos, we have to change from ego's logic to the logic of wisdom and reality. As a basis for wanting to wanting to love and have compassion for all sentient beings. Only when we understand this do we understand the logic of Buddha, that Buddha is saying. So okay, we ha right now we have enemies, friends, and strangers, and there's no fourth category. All sentient beings on the in the universe fit into those three. Donc d'accord, et aujourd'hui nous avons ces trois yeah. catégories et tous les êtres de l'univers s'intègrent yeah. dans l'une ou l'autre de ces trois catégories. Course, they will, ennemi, the, ennemi, the, the objects keep moving from one category to the other. Bien sûr, et you les know. objets passent d'une catégorie à l'autre. The stranger first, les étrangers d'abord. Then becomes your beloved. Donc ces étrangers vont devenir vos bien-aimés. And then it chucks you out for a younger version. Et puis quand ils vous auront jeté pour une version plus jeune. And now he goes into the enemy category. Et cette bien-aimé va passer dans la catégorie. And that can be in a week. Yeah. But these three, these three states of mind run the show. And of course, we don't, we don't question these. As we discussed in the wisdom wing, these are primordially deep assumptions. Ignorance, attachment, aversion. So here, let's look at the logic. Donc ici, regardons la logique. For why the, the ego's view is nonsense. Pourquoi est-ce que cette vue de l'ego est mm -hmm. un sens? Fundamentally, what Buddha is saying is, and we can almost say this is the basis of all Buddha's teachings. Fondamentalement, ce que dit Buddha, et on pourrait presque dire que c'est la base de tous les enseignements bouddhistes. All sentient beings want, all sentient beings want to be happy. Tous les êtres veulent être heureux. All sentient beings don't want suffering. So whatever level we interpret those words, I think we agree. Our views of what is happiness and our views of what is suffering and our views of the causes, they're all different. Yeah. So here we, we, we look into it specifically. So we want to, we, we have to try to cultivate this view called equanimity. This is the first of the eleven. This is the foundation practice. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so this word again, equanimity, is used in different contexts. In the wisdom wing, our practice, we can we can use the term equanimity. That refers to your own progression. As you get become less berserk, less up and down. Between attachment and aversion, yeah, you become more stable. You become you get more equanimity because you're more in control of your body, speech, and mind. You're not so extreme in your, in your craziness, you know. This is, an, this is one of the benefits of this level of practice. But here, the, equanimity, the word equanimity is used differently. It's a, if, it's, it's, if you, if, once you've accomplished it, and all these states of mind in these 11 take time to accomplish, equanimity is this heartfelt recognition that friend, enemy, and stranger are equal to each other from one point of view. They wish to be happy. They don't wish to suffer. So basically, in this technique, we're using logic to prove that to ourselves. So the wish to be so my so what we're trying to develop is eventually is my wish that they be happy. And my wish they not suffer. And that's love and compassion. Love is defined in Buddhism, and it's under the virtuous heading, not the negative heading. Yeah. Love is defined as it starts, like we discussed, as a thought. The thought. May you be happy. When I see you happy, I delight in your happiness. That's love. Compassion, may you not suffer. When I see suffering, I feel your pain. I have empathy. That's love and compassion. And that for the Buddha is the, they're the essence of all the virtuous qualities. And again, we can even subsume it down to the compassion itself, the compassion wing. It, seems, it encompasses all the good qualities. So let's try to prove to ourselves this logic that all friends, enemies, and strangers, which is the entire universe, are equal from this one point of view of wanting happiness and not wanting suffering. Because right now we couldn't care less if they do. So how do we feel at the moment? Well, I've got my beloved, let's say. My Gabriel, where's he gone? There he is, Gabriel. I have my beloved. We're in love. Which is, in the beginning, is like 90% attachment. And then, when, and then and then maybe 10% love. No, that's, no, that's not. When there's lots of attachment, there is also lots of love. In fact, we don't even think Almost, we almost don't even distinguish these two. This is really the part. As we've discussed in the wisdom wing, attachment is, attachment is junky inside us. It's totally eye-based. But it, when I'm in love with Gabriel, I, which is meaning attachment, I also do have love for him. I do want him to be happy. I have bucket loads of it for him. I have masses of love for him. There's no question. I have masses of compassion. But look what happens if he leaves me for a younger version. What happens to the love and compassion the next day? Turn off like a tap. And no way I want him to be happy. No way I want him not to suffer. This will be the most natural way we are, isn't it? And the first point we'd say is when someone says, well, you know, he wants to be happy and doesn't want to suffer just like everybody else. 
Et la première chose qu'on dirait quand on nous dit qu'il veut être heureux et qu'il ne veut pas souffrir exactement comme tous les autres. What are you talking about? De quoi parles-tu? He doesn't deserve love and, and, and you know, love and compassion. Il ne mérite pas d'amour et de compassion. And that's the basis for us. Et ça c'est la base pour nous. A person's got to deserve it. Une personne doit le mériter. And they only deserve it if they do what my attachment wants. Si il ou elle fait ce que mon attachement veut. And have compassion for me. Et qu'il a de la compassion. And love pour me. Et qu'il m'aime moi. So it's proof. Donc, la But this is too shocking for us. Mais, mais ça, on là. Because that's our logic. Trop pour nous parce of course I don't love him anymore. He's stopped loving me. Why should I love him, we say, you know? <laughs> And that's what we're trying to change. It's too shocking. It's horrible to hear this. It's shocking to hear this. What do you mean I should love him? Et c'est ça qu'on essaie de changer, parce que c'est terrible de penser des choses par l'écueil, de, de se dire, mais qu'est-ce que tu veux dire que je devrais l'aimer En d'autres mots, ça prouve que, comme le dit Lama Zopra, l'amour maintenant est instable. Et notre amour aujourd'hui est utterly based on attachment. Instable parce est so as long as he does what my attachment wants, basé sur donc aussi fait ce que which means make me happy, me and indeed love me, be kind to me, give me things, moi, me choses, then of course I love him. And that's logic for us. Ça, But it's a bit like Buddha's saying, Buddha, excuse me, Rabina, Whether Gabriel loves you or not has got whether Gabriel does what you want has got nothing to do with whether you should love him. Donc, or just because Gabriel no, just because Gabriel does what you want is no logical reason to love him, but that is our logical reason. It sounded a bit frantic. <laughs> Did you get it right? <laughs> We ran out. Did you get it right? <laughs> Buddha's basically saying, Buddha base, just because Gabriel is kind to me and does what I want and sacrifices his life for me and gives me things, choses, that's no logical reason to want him to be happy, which is love. But that is our logic, isn't it? So when he chucks me out for a younger version, and now he's in the enemy category, Buddha's now saying, just because Gabriel is mean to you is no logical reason not to want him to be happy. But we live in samsara's logic, which is not logic at all, it's ego's logic. It's made up. So then we have a stranger. And before we fell in love, he was a stranger. You know, you know say he was, let's say he was Anthony's friend. And Anthony tells me how this poor Gabriel has, gets migraines, let's say. I don't know, Gabriel. He's the bloke down the road. You see him. You see him in the shops, maybe, but you know you don't care. This is what a stranger means. He doesn't exist for me. He hasn't touched my life. Which we should be so ashamed of this intense ego-based logic. So when he's a stranger and he gets a migraine, I don't care. I, I try to sound. I try to be sympathetic. It doesn't last long. Lasts about one minute in my and Anthony's conversation. You know, I don't go rushing down there to help him. He's a stranger. My heart's not touched. So then we suddenly fall in love and he moves me in and I live with him. I stay up all night taking care of his headaches. I love him, have compassion. People say, oh, how kind Rabina is. She's so compassionate to Gabriel. Et là, je, je vais rester debout euh, toute la nuit pour essayer de l'assister et de l'aider avec sa migraine. Je suis que, et je l'aime tellement. How come not last week? Mais donc, comment se fait-il que la semaine... No, one, we don't question that. We don't question that. It seems like ridiculous. Why should I take care of a stranger? I mean, the whole world's full of strangers. Don't, be, don't exhaust me. 
Et, mais pourtant, et, euh, nous tous, et, et euh, personne d'entre nous euh, ne remet en cause cela, ne remet en doute cela, ne questionne cela. Et on va dire des choses comme, mais qu'est-ce que tu veux dire Le monde est plein d'étrangers, donc euh, ne m'épuise pas à me dire que je devrais m'occuper de ça. Et puis, maintenant qu'il m'a jeté pour une version... Oh, may he suffer with his migraines. Puisse-t-il souffrir avec sa migraine So the point here is one point, and it's so simple, but we can't hear. When, when Gabriel was labeled my stranger, I couldn't care less about his headaches. When he's labeled my friend, I'm heartbroken, so pained by his suffering. When he's my enemy, I hope he suffers. We know this. So what's the point here? Still, what's the point? Now, ask Gabriel when he was my stranger. Tell me about your headaches. Unbearable. When he's my beloved friend. Tell us about your headaches, Gabriel. Unbearable. Tell us about your headache when he's my ugly enemy. Unbearable. So from Gabriel's side, he's not a stranger and enemy and a friend. They're my projections. So if one second, he's a fr as a stranger, his headaches are unbearable for him. That never changes. So equally the same for the whole universe. All my strangers and my friends and my enemies, which are totally self-centered labels, we should be really embarrassed. We should be embarrassed to be found out to be so self-centered, to, to divide the entire universe in that way. But we don't. We just think it's normal. Qui sont des labels totalement centrés sur moi-même. Nous devrions en être embarrassés de se rendre compte que nous divisons tout l'univers avec des labels si centrés sur moi-même et nous trouvons tout ça comme si normal. Bouddha says we can go beyond that. Et le Bouddha nous dit, vous pouvez aller plus loin. One step at a time, yes. Oui, un pas après l'autre, c'est vrai. So this bodhisattva path is intense. Donc ce chemin de bodhisattva est intense. Love and compassion are not cute feelings you have every now and again. It's a powerful, logical, gradual, grown, stable, powerful, logical states of mind that, are, that, that eventually you can have permanently. So one step at a time, please. And this is why the same approach that we've been using since the beginning, using logic to argue with ego's misconceptions, is the method we're using to smash this nonsense from our mind so we can gradually grow genuine experiences of these positive qualities. You know. Et euh, avec ces euh, vues fausses mmh. qui nous euh, font diviser le monde en amis et ennemis étrangers, eh bien, vont nous permettre de et, euh, développer et, euh, ces euh, états d'esprit d'amour et de compassion. So we start where we are. Donc, on commence où on est. So how do we apply this one, this equanimity in daily life? Donc, comment va-t-on appliquer et cet état d'esprit, l'équanimité, dans la vie quotidienne? Easy, thousand times a day. You know. Facile, mille fois par jour. So equanimity is very specific. L'équanimité est très spécifique. Equanimity is the basis for wanting to grow love and compassion. Equanimity is, is, is the recognition that enemies, friends and strangers, the labels I put on people, solely based on how they treat me or not treat me, recognizing they have no valid basis in that person's mind, and that these three are therefore equal to each other, in their wish to be happy and not so. That's equanimity. Very precise. So it's easy to apply it in daily life. You know, you're a mother with your divine little child and they play, you know, football with the next kid whom you can't, next door neighbour whom you can't stand because they pick their nose and are rude, you know, let's say. 
joue au football avec euh, votre euh, et, euh, voisin et euh, donc, que vous ne supportez pas. Euh, qui est, so you have un attachment for your beloved. Donc vous avez l'attachement pour. And a version for the kid next door. Et la version pour euh, l'enfant de la maison. Okay, de I know you don't call them an enemy, but they're in the aversion category. Et je sais que vous ne les appelez pas ennemis, mais ils sont quand même dans la catégorie d'aversion. So the more, you know, so straight away. Donc, it's obvious your child has a million times more value to you. you know, that's because of attachment. Yeah. So when you, you know, when you see them playing, you know, just remind yourself. Just remind yourself that little kid who picks his nose feels exactly like my boy. In this second right now, wants to be happy and doesn't want to suffer just like my boy. It's applying equanimity right there. Forcing your mind to go beyond your own illogic. Then you're in, you're in a group of people, like at the centre, here, let's say, and you've got friends who come in the door. Hi, how are you, Marie, blah, blah, blah. And you're in a group all having fun together, all excited and talking. And a stranger walks in. Well, the first instinct is to stay with the friends, isn't it? Because we feel safe. Yeah. And the stranger doesn't even... We just don't see them properly. But just one second... They're exactly the same as my beloveds. They want to be happy, they want to suffer. That second, you go past your indifference, and a person begins to reveal themselves to you. So remember, this idea that all being, that they each want to be happy and not suffer the same as each other has got zero to do with whether they deserve it, which is the basis we use right now. Deserve is so heavy. Deserve means whether they've been nice to me or not. Or whether they, you know, they've been found to be a good person. You know. So if you read about the pedophile, what do you mean, want, want, you know, see that they also want to be happy and don't want to suffer? What are you talking about? Look what they've done. But that has got nothing to do with equanimity. We have to hear this. It's a very clear state of mind. It's getting beyond the labels of whether they're monsters, or they're delicious, they're ugly, they're beautiful. None of that's got to do with anything here. But in their mind, whether they're whether a pedophile or a saint, they're the same. In this sense, one sense, one sense. They're not the same in terms of their actions. They're not the same, they're not the same in terms of age, beauty, anything else. They're the same in terms of this one point. This is the crucial point. It's one point. They spontaneously want to be happy. They spontaneously don't want to suffer. That's the one point. That's it. So, of course, then you have to think, well, what's the consequence of this thinking? In me, at this moment. Well, you know, it, first of all, it doesn't mean that they're all they're all the same. Well, I might as well bring home the, the, the mean, ugly kid at home and, and give my kid to someone else. That's not the meaning. Or let's say you're the judge in the court for the pedophile. Just because you recognize that they're the same as your beloved wife sitting at home or your beloved husband sitting at home, they want to be happy and don't want to suffer. Just because you recognize that. Just because you recognize that. 
It doesn't mean you go, oh, well, it doesn't mean that you go, oh, well, the poor thing can't help it. Pat him on the head. You can get off, darling. You don't need to go to prison. No, it doesn't mean that at all. You know, you see your little pussycat. And if you're living in the tropics, like you know, you, you might see a big, a big, a big snake who's happy to eat your pussycat. Just because you recognise that the, 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 the snake wants to be happy, just like your pussycat. It doesn't mean you think, oh, the poor thing can't help a poor little thing. Let it eat my pussycat. No. So each of these points is very specific. It's the point that we're trying to get beyond the labels. Friend, enemy, stranger. Created by the three, the three toxic emotions. And go be, and get to beyond to see the human being. Or the being, the person there, the sentient being. And this fundamental drive that drives all of us. Yeah. So we're moving, going to move through these eleven techniques. And you know, many, and we'll eventually get to the point where we'll have, we will have, we will then practice developing this love. Yeah. So when you, if you think of the pedophile, if you're a bodhisattva, you have, en you have enormous love for that person. You would see their delusions, but you have incredible wisdom. You'd see their delusions. You'd see the negative karma they're creating. You, you recognize the harm they're causing. But if, they, if but, but like a your most precious child you only want them to be happy you can't bear to see the suffering they're causing themselves and others and you'd have the wisdom to know how to help them got nothing to do with attachment nothing to do with personal I mean that's an intense state of mind it takes a while to get there it's not just some gooey feeling with a few tears. Using logic to argue with ego's misconceptions. And we get that with the mother. Everybody else can't stand that junky kid. You know, she lies, she steals, she vomits in the soup. But the mother, her heart breaks for her. Because she knows she's harming herself. That's the basis of the compassion for the body suffers. That's the, that's the level of compassion that we're trying to cultivate. Yeah. Based on how we all harm each other. And you can never have that until you've done the wisdom wing, which is loving, understanding compassion, understanding karma for yourself. Yeah. And at the moment, we only have love and compassion for friends, basically, for those who do what we want, for those we're attached to. Pretty much. You know. And that attachment destroys our love and compassion. Mm. This is love and compassion that we're trying to cultivate. It's got zero to do with attachment, aversion, ignorance. Mm. That's huge. So don't hold your breath. One step at a time. Dinner time. So let's think of eating dinner. Let's first think of dinner made by all these people. We've never met that bunch of strangers. Cooked it, grew it, died from it. We sort of try to get compassion, but it's really hard, isn't it? If our beloved child did it, we'd be telling everybody in the whole dining room. Donc, 
peut-être nous n'avons jamais rencontré, qui sont des étrangers pour nous, comme toutes ces créatures qui sont mortes oui. dans la confection de, ce, de, de la nourriture pour ce dîner. Et donc tout ça, des étrangers... Hein, All the ants, all the creatures, all the, all the bugs killed on the road, you know, all the people, you know, cut it, grew it, cooked it. Yeah. It's real, this is true, this is scientific, this is not, this is not religion, this is fact. I mean, the food didn't drive itself here. <laughs> Et ce que j'ai oublié, c'est si c'était notre fils bien-aimé qui avait été le chef cuisinier, alors là, on le raconterait à toute la salle à manger. Mais, so we go, we go beyond our attachment and aversion. mais donc, si on va au-delà de notre propre attachement et aversion, dès qu'on arrive, and our eyes scan the shapes and colors in the bowls, donc notre esprit va scanner toutes les, yeah. formes, les couleurs dans les plats. No attachment, aversion, oh, don't like that much. Oh, very delicious. I want more of that one. Where's the rest of that one? I want that butter. <laughs> We'll try and see it as, as if your children, your beloved, your beloveds just made it for you. Your beloved husband or your beloved child just made this lunch, this dinner for you. You'll be weeping in joy how kind they are and you'd never dare tell them it's ugly. Et donc, essayez de voir ce dîner euh, comme si c'était votre mari bien-aimé ou votre enfant bien-aimé euh, qu'il avait euh, cuisiné et que vous en auriez les larmes aux yeux de penser qu'il euh, il a, il a, il a fait tout ça et que la pensée que ça puisse ne pas vous plaire ne vous viendrait même pas à l'esprit. There's this one, they always talk about this particular body, such a... It was called the always crying one. Anytime he saw anything, you know, food, a cup, he just imagined all the people who made it. He burst into tears with gratitude. <laughs> well, slowly, slowly. Okay. So we think this, we think this, eh? and we're grateful to all these kind sentient beings. So the conclusion from this, and this fits into the 11 points we'll discuss later. It fits into the 11 points we'll discuss later. The conclusion from this, let us have a gooey feeling. I must continue to work on myself so I can repay their kindness. And then enjoy your dinner. See you at 8h. Oui? Okay.